moment the lens was born, the Bible caught fire and the universe was cracked open. There are some books you're never meant to read. For centuries, one was locked away, not by chains, but by blindness. The words were always there, but the world couldn't see them clearly. And when we finally did, the truth spilled out across parchment, across glass, across the cosmos. One simple invention shattered scripture and revealed a deeper order hiding in plain sight. And the universe was never the same again. For centuries, the Bible wasn't just sacred, it was off limits. Most people had never even laid eyes on it, let alone read it. For over a thousand years, it was copied by hand, line by line, letter by letter. Every version was a little bit different. Some pages were smudged, others were missing altogether. The Word of God lived in fragments. Then came Gutenberg. In 1455, he printed the Bible for the very first time. Every copy was identical, and suddenly anyone could see what they were told to believe. But here's the catch. What if the book was clear, but your vision wasn't? Because if you couldn't read the Word, salvation fell farther out of reach. They reached for lenses. They just wanted to see the Word more clearly, but they had no idea what they had unlocked. This story isn't just a story of salvation in the Bible. It's a story of a lens, a lens that cracked the church. In 1455, Gutenberg printed the Bible, and for the first time, every copy looked the same, word for word, line for line, and suddenly what had only been heard could finally be seen. The deeper humanity looked into books, into blood, into cells, into stars, the harder it became to hold the truths we once called sacred. By the 1700s, Europe wasn't even reading the Bible necessarily to obey it. They were reading to test it. What used to be gospel was now a hypothesis that you could test and possibly prove wrong. People no longer accepted truth just because a priest said it. They wanted evidence. They wanted to see it clearly for themselves. The scientific method roared throughout Europe. But that clarity came with a twist. The book was clear, but your vision wasn't. And suddenly, bad eyesight wasn't just frustrating, it was a barrier to knowledge, to power, to salvation itself. If you couldn't read it, you couldn't be saved. That pressure triggered something new. Supply and demand, glass makers, fusing silica, flame-lit workshops glowing in the night. Eyeglasses weren't new in Gutenberg's time. They had appeared almost two centuries before in 1285, first in Pisa and in Venice. They were crude convex lenses held in leather or bone frames, not the kind you can get at lens crafters. Monks used them to copy scripture. Merchants used them to tally ledgers, but they were rare. Functional, sure. Essential, not yet. One man could read effortlessly while the other one would squint. But Gutenberg put things in sharp focus. First the Bible, then everything else. The word went viral. Books spread like wildfire. And so did the pressure to read those books. But here's the problem. If the print was sharp and crisp, but your eyes were blurry and confusing, the problem wasn't the book, it was you. People realized their eyes couldn't keep up. Eyeglasses stopped being curiosities. They became keys to scripture, to society, to the future. And across Europe, the race began, not just to make more lenses, but to make them better, higher power, clearer glass. And by the 1400s, Guilds in Nuremberg were mass-producing rivet spectacles. Wearable, repeatable, revolutionary. It's hard to overestimate how much the eyeglasses changed the world, but the materials were uneven. The glass could be cloudy, and for most people, vision correction was still mostly trial and error. Precision glass wasn't a luxury anymore. It became survival technology for the masses, equal parts salvation and status. And then the Dutch stepped in. Now, why did the Dutch make the best glass on earth? The Dutch were masters at traders. The Dutch East India Company built cities like Amsterdam, Middleburg, Delft. Merchant ships were gliding in and out with the raw materials to make glasses. But only the Dutch turned this into a national obsession. They didn't just want to fix your eyesight. They wanted to build a mercantile empire upon it. So by the early 1600s, these cities like Amsterdam weren't just trade hubs. They were optical R&D laboratories. And here's how the Netherlands became the Silicon Valley of lenses. Most countries that wanted to produce glasses had to work with whatever sand and soot they could find around. But the Dutch had the East India Company, the world's most powerful trading company, and that gave them worldwide access to Bohemian crystal, to Venetian soda ash, 
To quartz sand so pure they needed almost no refining whatsoever. Liquid glass would swirl in huge melting pots, sand. While others prayed for clarity, the Dutch could engineer it, controlling thickness, purity, and strength. They were building optics with military-grade precision, and the mass literacy that was brought on earlier created mass demand for their products. In most of Europe, salvation was preached in Latin, but in the Netherlands, Calvinism taught that you had to seek salvation yourself through inquiry, and that meant reading, learning, and developing your own ideas. Suddenly, scripture wasn't ceremonial, it was personal. And if you couldn't see, you couldn't read. And if you couldn't read, well, you know the rest. Reading became an almost spiritual duty, and it had a spin-off event, into research into the heavens itself and the questioning of what that very first Bible really told us about the scientific structure of the universe. In the Netherlands and places like Delft and Middleburg, something rare happened. Craftsmen lived together and worked within shouting distance of each other. Glass blowers right next to lens grinders. Instrument makers ricocheting ideas from one bench to another. One guild would improve clarity. Another would push on magnification. Another would push on frame technology and stabilization. And that's where these workshops led to legends like Hans Lippershey who filed for a patent in October 1608 for a lens that could pull distant objects near, a telescope, a perspective tube. He wasn't the only one, but the Dutch paid him as if he was anyway, and his telescope took off. The Steve Jobs of the Silicon Valley of the Netherlands of the 17th century. Meanwhile, Zacharias Jensen and his father were stacking lenses, testing what we now call the compound microscope, made of multiple lenses. The records, like the lenses before them, are somewhat hazy, but something world-changing was brewing. The microscope, the telescope, suddenly Dutch lenses weren't just correcting vision, they were extending our senses outward to the stars and inward to the building blocks of life itself, and what they revealed was astounding and threatening as well. While much of Europe was shutting its doors, the Dutch opened theirs. They welcomed Jews, Huguenots, and anyone with radical ideas like a young man named Baruch Spinoza. At 23, his own synagogue had excommunicated him for asking the wrong questions. Questions like, what if God wasn't a man incarnate? But what if God was part of the natural order of nature? What if scripture was a historical document, not the divine word of God? You wouldn't need to ask priests and rabbis. You could seek it yourself. By day, Spinoza had a trade. He could grind some of the most precise lenses in all of Europe, praised for their minimal spherical and chromatic aberration. But by night, he worked on the blueprints of secular philosophy, a philosophy of nature that would later influence the theological beliefs of one Albert Einstein three centuries later. But money talked, and in the Dutch Republic, owning a telescope wasn't just about science, it was about status, prestige, a conversation piece with cosmic implications. Because to look through one was to risk something your church or synagogue or your worldview might not tolerate and you might not survive. People asked as they peered through the lenses, what else is out there? What are we a part of? What are we made of? And who, if anyone, is rightfully at the center? In that moment, the lens wasn't just a tool, it was a dare. Antoine van Leeuwenhoek wasn't a scientist, he was a draper, a fabric maker. But in the back of his shop, under a flickering flame, he spent hours grinding tiny lenses, each no bigger than a pea, a lentil, for which the lens is named. They were for seeing smaller things, not distant things. He built simple single lens microscopes that could magnify up to 275 times, far sharper than any compound microscope of that era. And in it, he could zoom into droplets of water, see into sperm cells and bacteria and capillaries and human veins under glass. He pointed them into rainwater, into blood, into saliva, and what he found rewrote the rules of reality itself. Microscopic life was teeming in every drop. Cells wriggled with a purpose like tiny arrows, but they had no brains, no soul, no spirit. Capillaries pulsed with blood, life force, multiplying, moving, an angelic fresco, dissolving under the lens. Until then, the unseen was sacred, attributed to angels, to demons, to divine mystery. If it was invisible, it was unknowable. You were forbidden to ask about. But Leenhook shattered those ideas. 
He showed the unseen wasn't mystical, it was microbial. It had form, it had movement, it had purpose seemingly. One thing was for sure, it was real. And if an entire universe could live inside a single droplet of water, what did that say about our macrocosm? Luin Hook's handwritten observations and sketches of animalcules besides stained glass manuscripts brought reality into a new focus, the microscopic world. But there was a bigger revolution about to come, displacing humanity away from the center like a giant lever. We weren't divine observers, we were part of the system itself. Organisms made of cells surrounded by others, not alone and not central and not eternal. And then with Galileo's telescope, all hell broke loose. Galileo's telescope was the lever that displaced the Earth from the center of the universe. And while Luin Hook was uncovering the invisible life at the microcosmic level, Galileo turned his lenses skyward, cracking open the macrocosmos. A year after Hans Lippershape filed the telescope patent in 1608, the idea had reached Italy, and Galileo talked about a certain Dutchman who had come up with the idea. He never even saw Hans's design, but he didn't need to. He was so brilliant he could build his own, sharper, stronger, more powerful, more stable on a telescope mount that he invented, and he pointed it towards the stars above. And that's when everything shattered forever. The moon, it wasn't a smooth crystalline ball made of ethereal materials unlike the Earth. It was cratered, mountainous, and torn, just like the Earth. Jupiter was not alone. It had four moons clearly revolving around it, not the Earth. And Venus, it had phases, just like our moon. It meant it orbited the sun, not the Earth, against what the Catholic Church had taught. This was all hiding in plain sight, but it took the lens, optimized, refined, and developed for decades in conversations all across Europe to shatter the Ptolemaic system that had ruled for centuries, for millennia. Earth at the center, heaven above, God above it all. But now the telescope said otherwise. We weren't central, we weren't even close. The church tolerated math. It tolerated ideas to some extent. It even tolerated looking at the heavens and telling horoscopes. But the telescope, it was technology that refracted the church's reality. In 1616, the church officially banned heliocentrism, and Galileo, the maestro, was warned, do not teach this principle ever again. You may research it, you may write about it in Latin, but do not teach it to the natives in Italian that they could understand themselves. But Galileo didn't stop. In 1632, he published a dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, Ptolemaic and Copernican. It was a bold defense of Copernicus's heliocentrism, and it was a direct shot at the church's authority. The backlash was expected and immediate. In 1633, he was tried for heresy and found vehemently suspect of it. He was forced to recant at knife point and sentenced to lifelong house arrest. But Galileo kept watching. He kept writing. He kept looking and he kept making new discoveries, like the discourse which described laws that we now ascribe to the first application and writing of the scientific method. This was too dangerous to publish in Galileo's native Italy or any Catholic country. So he snuck it to the Netherlands, where it was published by Elsevier, a journal house that still exists to this very day. It was published in 1644, the confluence of technology, craftsmanship, and capitalism led to the ultimate understanding of what we're still searching and looking forward to this very day. How did it all begin? What is it all made of? And how, potentially, may it all end? Four centuries later, we're still looking for these answers. Today, the lenses are sharper, the questions deeper, and slightly less dangerous. Except for maybe your tender prospects. At 5,200 meters above sea level in Chile's Atacama Desert, the Simons Observatory scans the oldest light in the universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation, searching for telltale signs, not of planets, not of stars or cells, but of signals from the inflationary origin of the universe, just a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. It's not about proving scripture wrong. It's about finding what came before scripture even existed. This is the scientific tradition carried forward. The same mission, but with million dollar precision. The microscope, the telescope, commerce, the printing press, the enlightenment, 
not to disprove God or belief itself, but to look past it, past Genesis, past the spiritual, into the scientific. Beginnings, expansion, collision, entropy, the nature of consciousness and time itself. And still, just like the 1400s, we use magnificent lenses to see more clearly.